morning, bonjour, welcome to Paris. So don't be shy, you can come to the front if you want, but uh, we've got a few people drifting in at the back. Uh, my name is Mark Critch, I'm Chief Executive of My Society. It's my great pleasure to welcome you to uh, Tech Tech, the fifth edition. And uh, it's uh, took, took uh, obviously it was a difficult decision to come to Paris in the springtime and uh, have the event here. So it's great to see so many of you. Um, and first of all, we're incredibly grateful for the OECD for hosting us in, in this really wonderful venue. Uh, yeah, we're fortunate this year to overlap with the OECD's Global Anti-Corruption and Integrity Forum, which I hope and suspect many of you will be attending over the next few days. Um, can I just remind you, uh, do not forget your OECD badge, because to get to the workshop sessions in the Chateau, which is about a five minute walk away, you will need your badge to get through there. So as you can understand, the security is, uh, is, is quite tight. Um, and also for those of you, first of all, who's been to Tech Tech before? Can you just raise your hands? It's about half of you so far, that's pretty good. Um, you may remember the last time that we overlapped with a conference, it was in Florence. It was actually the uh, 2017 Italian Balloon Animals Conference. <laughs> um, so I'm glad, you know, obviously this year we've come up in the world somewhat, uh, although I um, obviously apologise that you won't be able to make any balloon poodles or uh, hats or anything, but maybe we can arrange that for tomorrow. Um, I'd also like to especially thank our headline sponsors, Google. Um, they're sponsoring Tech Tech for the third year, which we're incredibly grateful. Um, you'll be hearing from them for a short plenary session after lunch. Unfortunately, Megan Reiskamp was due to speak, hasn't been able to travel, so we're going to uh, have to reduce uh, their session. Uh, however, we are going to meet at 2 o'clock out in the lawn for a, a group photograph. Um, and you'll be directed where to go to there. So if you can join us for that, that'd be fantastic. Um, I'd also like to thank Luminate. Uh, anyone from Luminate in the room yet? There's Stacey at the back, fantastic. Um, Luminate also very kindly uh, supported the event this year. But also more than anything else, I want to thank Luminate for the incredible support and uh, grants they've given us over the past eight years. It's really been transformational for us and also transformational for the sector. Um, so uh, you'll be hearing from Lumine, I think, tomorrow morning in the Latin American session, and also Stacey speaking uh, in one of the final sessions uh, on Wednesday afternoon. So each year we seem to open the conference with you're facing greater challenges externally. I mean, you're in more intractable problems, politics increasingly in disarray, and, and obviously 2019 so far has, has hardly disappointed. Your democracy itself is at risk. Your journalism is undermined at every turn. Your public services struggle under the burden of austerity. Your trust in political institutions is at an all-time low. And all of this is happening at the same time with a slow burn environmental catastrophe all around us. So you may ask yourself, you're facing such challenges, what role does civic tech have to play? You know, if so, if it does have a role, you know, what is that role and, and how might it uh, contribute? And most importantly, where is the evidence? And that's very much what Tech Tech is about. Tech Tech is about identifying what works and why, building the evidence base for the sector, helping more people participate in research, uh, and really kind of uh, help uh, lead to, to greater impact. So we really hope over the next couple of days you'll be able to help us answer exactly those questions. So at my society, we believe in helping people be active citizens. And many of us in the room aim to empower citizens to, to help support healthy and transparent democracies, to hold power to account, to help increase trust and help people strengthen their own communities. And this chimes with the research from the New Citizenship Project, uh, some colleagues of ours in London. Uh, they, uh, they found that when we think of ourselves as citizens, we're more likely to participate to volunteer and to come together to make our society stronger and more effective. So the actual act of considering yourself as a citizen is a necessary first step towards change. But what's clear is we must really go further and faster than ever before. We must work with the communities and individuals we seek to support rather than applying technology from a distance. And we need to do so in a new age of humble, collaborative and appropriate action within better understood systems of change led by those actually affected. You know, as Beck uh, will outline in her opening remarks, we need to move beyond the early days of volunteer-led hacking efforts, beyond, frankly, the international expansion of tech for tech's sake, and move beyond 
thinking, well, if technology was the answer, what was the question again? You're on issues such as climate change, which are very close uh, to my heart as well, you're, we're being shamed by our children uh, over our inaction. You're, what role does civic tech have to play, in, especially perhaps in the last mile of decarbonisation, which is going to be so critical over the next 10 years? You're from our own work, knowing who your MP is, is you're really important, but that didn't prevent the divisions that have led to Brexit. You know, it needs to be more powerful than the work's been done to date. So in our own practice, we're reconsidering how we work through a new programme, Public Square, uh, which is looking at research into how to uh, really explore locally-led uh, participatory democracy. We're doing that with the Democratic Society, and that's also funded by Illuminate as well. But uh, over the next two days, you're going to hear from 76 speakers from 14 different countries, each of whom are obviously trying to make it happen. You have 13, I'm very pleased to say, 39 uh, speakers are women, 37 are men. So a majority female lineup this year, which is a first for us and some we're very proud of. And about 200 attendees from a total of 29 countries. And of course, what's great about Tech Tech is so many of you could be a speaker or be on stage. It's kind of, you're really, we hope you use the next couple of days to meet your peers, to discuss, debate, and kind of share new ideas. And uh, with new ideas, um, this morning's keynote is going to be from Alessandra Orofino of Nossas in Brazil. She's going to talk about how democratic societies are essential in order to fight platform populism. Uh, tomorrow's keynote will be from James Anderson of Bloomberg Philanthropies. Bloomberg have really been instrumental through their What Works Cities initiatives in supporting the work of 250 local governments and mayors around the world. Yeah. And that local participation is especially important when leadership is lacking at a national level. And interestingly, we're also going to hear from the tech giants themselves. Uh, tomorrow's plenary session from Facebook should prove to be pretty interesting, I would imagine, considering uh, the events of the last year or two. And so whilst organisations like Facebook wield so much power over our everyday lives, do they actually have what it takes to address the multitude problems themselves? Can the people who enable the problems be the ones who fix it? So uh, my good friend Sami Chakrabarti from Facebook will be here to talk about work uh, they uh, undertook in the midterm elections in the US. So I know a lot of people in the room will be skeptical of Facebook's ability to, to deal with that. So I'm looking forward to some good, robust discussion uh, and some good questions, I'm sure. Um, if over the next two days you like what you've seen and you're based in the UK, uh, I'm glad to say we're also going to be uh, having our next, uh, next installment of Tech Tech Local, which uh, looks to support local government. So we did that for the first time in Manchester in November last year. That's going to be in City Hall in London on November the 1st, so we hope many of you will be able to join us for that. And uh, we definitely will be back with Tech Tech next year. We haven't decided on a, a venue yet. I know Reykjavik in Iceland has been mentioned. We'll see if that's practical or not, but uh, we'll certainly be uh, coming back to you with uh, ideas uh, in the next couple of months. Um, I'd like to single out, as ever, Gemma and Beck. So Gemma's down the back. Let's all wave to Gemma. The Gemma is, as many of you will know, is the absolute superstar who makes all of this happen. So thank you so much. Also, there we go, yes. And she's been ably supported by Holly from the OECD, who's sitting down the front and looking slightly embarrassed. But she's, she's been the Gemma equivalent at the OECD. Incredibly grateful for all the help you've given. Um, and also uh, support, I'm not sure if Paula Forteza is here yet, um, the uh, French MP. Uh, Paula has been a huge supporter of Tech Tech over the years, and she really twisted her arm to come to Paris this year. Admittedly, we didn't need too much uh, pushing. Uh, but she's been great. Her, her and her team have been fantastic in, in just uh, helping uh, gather speakers and kind of uh, the overall support, and uh, we're incredibly grateful for, for the work they've done. So you'll be able to hear directly from Paula, uh, and also the Deputy Mayor of Paris, Pauline Veron, will be uh, speaking in a session, I think, just before lunch. Uh, they'll be looking at digital democracy as a, as a response to the Gilets jaunes, which should, uh, is obviously quite timely uh, for any of you who've been in Paris over the last few days or weeks. So... Also, for any of you who have signed up, um, apologies if you haven't signed up yet, but uh, at the end of the day, there'll be a drinks reception in the French Parliament, and uh, I think the buses will be outside somewhere. No doubt some people better informed than me will make sure you get to the buses. Um, so 
now I think I'm okay on time. I haven't even had my five minutes yet, which is good. But I'm going to hand over to uh, Anthony Gooch, who's our gracious host. Anthony's uh, Director of Public Affairs and Communication at the OECD. So he's going to be telling you a little bit about the OECD's work and, and kind of how this overlaps and no doubt about the Integrity Forum over the next couple of days. Um, after that, uh, Dr. Rebecca Rumble, uh, our esteemed head of research, will be uh, giving her take on the third age of civic tech, which is going to be fascinating, I'm sure. So enjoy the next couple of days. I really look forward to speaking to each and every one of you over the next couple of days. If I have a slightly glazed look over my face, just make sure you say, remember me, I met you last year, whatever, and I'm sure I'll be fine. But, uh, so bear with me on that. Thank you so much for coming. I'll hand over to Antina now. Thank you. So good morning and uh, welcome to the OECD. Um, listening to Mark, many of the things that he has just set out and that you and we are going to be uh, looking at for the next two days, I think they, are, they chime very strongly with the issues that we see as being front and centre as far as the work of this organisation is concerned and what we can do. So the OECD, the, the other acronym uh, uh, here. Um, I'm delighted to uh, welcome you uh, to Paris. Um, this is my first uh, Tic Tech, and in a sense, you had to come to the OECD for me to get the chance to actually attend because too many members of my team are too, many, are too keen to go to allow me to go. So fortunately, on this occasion, I managed to squeeze in. On, on the contrary, they, they've been doing a super job in the last uh, uh, three years, I think it is, in firstly identifying uh, uh, Tic Tech for us, for the OECD, uh, and then in becoming involved in your community. And it's a real honor, uh, I think, for us also to see that uh, an organization like this uh, wants to come to a place like uh, the OECD. So we are not, um, we don't believe that we're the center of the world. Uh, we're known for many things. And uh, at the same time, we need to constantly try to be uh, broadening uh, the communities that we interact with. So for us, it's a, uh, it's a, it's a pleasure, but it's also really important that we've, um, we've managed to entice you here. As Mark said, we had to uh, twist many arms uh, in order uh, to, to do this. Now, the OECD is uh, an acronym uh, that holds a certain degree of mystery I'd like to ask a question. Now, how many of you have been to the OECD before? Hands up. Right, that's a small number of people. One or two came because they came to our forum, so you don't count because we invited you. It's like the, doc the good doctor in the front row. Um, how many of you know what the OECD does? Oh, that's a lot more. That's great. Um, but like any organization, what you know about us, and certainly what I knew when I joined this organization, it tends to come from a particular angle. So this is a, I wouldn't call it a beast, it's a multi-headed organization. It has many, many bits and attributes uh, uh, to it. But you, might, you may, in a way, some of you be wondering why we were uh, so keen uh, to host uh, this conference. Um, now, the OECD is an international organization. I know that that's not necessarily heavily in vogue in certain places, but uh, we have considerable convening power, and perhaps the fact that TicTech has chosen to come here is a reflection of that. Now, we, we don't just bring governments together here. Uh, the people who make public policy and shape public policy are very, very variegated. The stakeholders involved and if that wasn't the case before, I would say certainly in the last few years, the actors involved in public policy making have grown and shifted uh, even more. We've been um, looking back in time here because we're celebrating 20 years of the OECD's forum. The OECD's forum was created just after uh, the uh, anti-globalization movement uh, hit in inverted commas the OECD the, around the multilateral agreement on investments. The demographic in this room is relatively young. I'm starting to feel my age. Some of you will remember Seattle, 1999, or have heard of it, the World Trade Organization meeting. So the OECD's forum emerged from that. 
because the perception of the OECD was of uh, an international organization that was up to no good, you know, smoke-filled rooms. Uh, I have some pictures up in my uh, office of people in the 50s and 60s, and they, the rooms were filled with smoke. People were drinking whiskies, and it was mainly men in suits. Of course, they, the, the place has changed a great deal since then. But uh, when you think back to, uh, to that moment in time and what was going on uh, at that time, uh, already policy was shifting hugely, for example, in areas like international trade, which was the preserve of the cognoscenti, and suddenly uh, it became an issue that most people wanted to know about, whether they were involved in the NGO community, in a company they were working for, where suddenly uh, production was being outsourced or, or changed in its uh, uh, location. And I think it, if we chart forward that... Um, Democratization of public policy has been uh, a constant, certainly in my professional uh, uh, lifetime. So we bring governments together, certainly, uh, but we also bring this broader policy-shaping community together to look at what policies work best. We try and provide trusted comparative data and evidence. Again, I know that wasn't so fashionable. Uh, a couple of years ago, someone said that uh, we'd had enough of experts. I think experts are making a bit of a comeback, but also, obviously part of that is how experts themselves operate and uh, behave. Now, our mission is better policies for better lives, and that sums up what we try and do. It isn't a tagline, and it's quite a difficult thing to live up to. And certainly in the last few years, I'd say it's been a very difficult thing uh, to uh, uh, live up to. Uh, so the, our vocation goes beyond uh, the provision of cold, dry facts. Uh, we're in the business of improving people's lives. And we are a partner uh, for civil society and the people behind movements and organizations. Back in 2010, we invited representatives from the Indignados movement, who were the precursor of the Occupy movement. They began in the center of, uh, of Madrid. We then invited uh, representatives from the Occupy movement to join us. And we didn't do this, uh, how can I put it, in a self-serving way. We did it because I saw an op-ed written by the Occupy movement citing the OECD as part of a potential solution and thinking, super, they, these people have heard of us. They know who we are. Let's have them come into our space and be able to uh, discuss uh, and exchange with us uh, directly. So we, we know that policy isn't made in a vacuum, and its impacts are by no means limited to uh, one particular of, uh, element of society alone. So to ensure that we deliver on our mission, uh, we have to help governments to respond to the needs of their citizens. Now, the Open Government Partnership, uh, who are represented here today, I'm sure that they will remember our work uh, Focus on Citizens, Public Engagement for Better Policy and Services in 2009, that helped lay the foundations uh, for this effort. Uh, our own OECD open government team is still working hard to move the needle forward from open government to open state and more inclusive uh, governance. The OGP does bring back memories to me because initially the OECD was not involved in the, OEG, uh, in the OGP and through um, a certain number of efforts that I was involved with, uh, uh, we, we were involved in that process and I remember attending uh, the side event that, that was organized in, in New York uh, to kick that process off and delighted to see that that is going strong. Now, you may still be asking yourselves, why would we, as OECD, be interested in civic tech? So the OECD has evolved considerably in these last 20 years, as I was uh, uh, saying, and perhaps we've uh, learned the hard way about the importance of placing citizens at the heart of uh, what we do. And uh, events around the world remind us every day uh, individuals can be vi vibrant uh, uh, ag agents for change, holding world leaders accountable for their welfare, physical safety, the protection of our planet, regardless of their ethnicity and gender. And taken together, actions that at first appear small can become powerful forces of disruption and change. Who would have thought a 16-year-old Swedish schoolgirl would suddenly become world famous as one of the key campaigners on climate? I certainly wouldn't. In the past decade, civic tech has shifted from a fringe movement of hackers and coders to a more mainstream term. 
importantly used by policymakers and policy shapers. It's become part of the language in this organization, for example. Three years ago, the, the OECD didn't really use the term uh, civic tech. Uh, organizations such as ours are not known for our speed and reactivity, uh, but this indeed is now uh, part of our lexicon as well. Uh, I believe that we first used the term in relation to the OECD Better Life uh, Index. Uh, the index is an online platform for us to engage with citizens and learn what matters most for their quality of life in an effort to complement official uh, statistics. We quickly drew the link between the index and the aims of civic tech, transparency, accountability, participation, and citizen engagement. Back in 2016, uh, I read an article in Le Monde by Catherine Vincent, La civic tech sauvera-t-elle le politique? Is civic tech going to save politics? And in it, she said, and uh, some of you will be francophone in this room, so I'll read it out in French first and then give you a translation. En mettant en réseau un grand nombre de citoyens, la technologie civique permettait tout à la fois de les informer, de les faire dialoguer ensemble et de donner leur avis, bref, de faire émerger une intelligence collective assurant à son tour une meilleure participation citoyenne aux instances démocratiques. By connecting a wide number of citizens, civic tech allows them to access information, creates a space for dialogue and sharing opinions, essentially harnessing collective intelligence, ensuring better citizen partic participation in democracy. Now, your eyes may all be glazing over going, yeah, yeah, we know all that stuff. Wow, if I had that mission, I would be sitting up every day going, wow, that is something to live up to. Because I have to say, we, when, when I read that, I was thinking, this is, this is part of the solution here. So in what uh, Mark said uh, uh, earlier, and I think you're going to be exploring the impact of civic tech, you know, are, are you really able to deliver on that? We are uh, uh, super uh, interested in uh, uh, following this discussion because we are very hopeful. This is one of those elements that we hold up as part of the, the solution uh, to very complicated times. Uh, could these elements help the OECD maintain its relevance and credibility in a rapidly changing context? After attending the OGP summit here in Paris in 2016 and watching Rebecca pitch Tech 2017, we saw the values of civic tech as a compass for helping us navigate and improve our engagement with people. That first Tic Tech taught us valuable lessons about how to achieve greater impact. A even more importantly, it exposed us to a community of people behind the technological solutions who are challenging their own assumptions and working on concrete projects. The OECD is committed to serving people from all parts of the globe. We were just discussing Brazil earlier. Brazil are not a member of OECD, but we work very closely with people in that country. And I know there are Brazilians in this room alongside people from many countries who are OECD and beyond OECD. And we're trying to strive to build the, uh, the, bring the wealth of experience, views, and ideas to bear on the policy-making space. This is something that crystallizes at our annual forum, including more voices to help us address the world's pressing challenges in an open, dynamic, and creative space. So 2017 was the year when we inaugurated the Civic Tech Hub at our forum here, indeed in, 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 in this conference uh, uh, area that you're in now. We saw it as an opportunity to get civic tech organizations and actors into the OECD bloodstream, uh, channeling and transmitting this interest and enthusiasm to our colleagues and stakeholders. Speakers have covered a range of topics from sharing tools for empowerment to coding the law, educating for civic innovation, and the potentials and pitfalls of civic tech. What have we learned? The real, protect, uh, the real potential of these technologies probably has yet to be realized. That's number one. Two, offline engagement strategies, meeting people where they are, is equally, if not more important, for the adoption and the quality of impact of civic tech. You're proof of that because you come together physically here, not just in that connection that you may have on a, on a regular basis. Thirdly, open source, decentralized, collaborative peer production of software is vital for shared tools, but the digital divide isn't simply erased by civic tech. And fourthly, we need to be constantly evaluating our assumptions, exactly what you're going to be doing in the course of this conference. 
It was in part thanks to many of you that we have evolved in our thinking about the route to collective intelligence and where technology plays a role. We've continued to witness manifestations of civic tech in our government practice over the years. Our colleagues at the OECD have examined the role of GovTech, participatory budgeting, open government data, and local level efforts in our reports, and we're sharing this experience further and further. In fact, I believe we also featured the Open Heroines Network in our recent Open Government Data Report. Some OECD staff members are members of that network too. So in May, on the 20th and 21st of May, we'll host the 20th edition of the OECD Forum, focusing on a world in emotion, reflecting a time of great societal, economic, and political change, upheaval, and disruption amplified by the dual forces of globalization and digitalization. Recent events are indeed challenging our understanding and ability to forecast the future. What can I do? What can I do? Tell me what to do. These are some of the dilemmas we all face at times as we grapple with such complex problems on such grand scales. Each year we seek to develop an agenda that resonates with the evolution of our times and our work looks quite different in 2019. Where we used to focus on strong, sustainable economic growth, we now need inclusive growth that places people at the core of our approach and policies and critically addresses the inequalities that we amongst international organizations were the first to put our finger on back in 2008 when we diagnosed those inequalities within OECD countries, supposedly those that were the best off. Our ambition at this year's forum will be to explore how to transform these increasing expressions of uncertainty and anger into collective commitment for positive action. And now that you have a taste of the OECD, I'd encourage you all to come back and join us uh, here in May. The weather's even better then. The ultimate goal of gatherings like the OECD forum and TICTEC is to ensure that people really have a say in the issues affecting their societies and that policy agendas are responsive to their needs and aspirations. We're trying to achieve this goal looking at different but complementary policy areas that are essential to improving people's quality of life. Today and tomorrow, a number of colleagues across the OECD will be sharing interesting initiatives with you, focusing on how to make public services design and delivery more inclusive and representative, with or without the use of technology shedding light on the necessity to quantify intra-urban inequalities in subjective well-being, that's OECD parlance for how you feel, you feel good, you don't feel so good, um, and the implications this has for public policy. As surprising as it may seem uh, to residents here in the greater Paris areas, they can have degrees of life satisfaction as, uh, as different as a Ukrainian and a Swiss, even though they may live within the same 20 kilometer radius. And last but not least, the Better Life Index team organizing a workshop on how to engage citizens around the key dimensions of well-being, reflecting on our eight year journey and where we can go next with that uh, project. That will be this afternoon, so a little plug for, for the team uh, there. Sharing this kaleidoscope of ideas and projects with your community is really useful for us. You provide a different and complementary vantage point and a host of potential avenues for collaboration. Whether we use technology because we want to revitalize the relationship citizens have with their cities, their communities, their representatives and governments, we understand it is the vehicle but not the destination. Now we're excited to work with you on this journey. We have some ideas about how we can work together to achieve greater impact and we look forward to hearing from you over the next days. Let me, in turn, just as Mark did, take a moment to thank the team who put this uh, event together from our side and who've been following all of these initiatives. Uh, Holly, uh, Sarah, Jan, Nuria, Virginie, uh, and Vincent, without whom this event wouldn't have happened here at our uh, location. Many of them will be presenting the index later as well. So please continue to share your vision, your successes, your failures, and tell us where you see opportunities for us to collaborate as we go forward. Thank you very much. Good morning, everyone. Uh, for those of you that don't know me, 
Um, I'm Rebecca Rumble. I'm head of research at my society. And as research, uh, uh, head of research at my society, I'm one of the founders of Tic Tac five years ago. I always get about 15 minutes uh, to speak to you guys at the beginning of Tic Tac. So I think it's been talked up a little bit too much. Um, this isn't going to be the <laughs> fascinating talk maybe that Mark was talking about. Uh, but these are maybe just some observations that I've been kind of thinking about over the last year. Um, the third age of civic tech is a bit of a, it's a bit of a gimmicky title, I know. Um, the reason it's that is because, as the speakers amongst you know, uh, you get a hassly email from Gemma months in advance of this event saying, I need your title, I need to know what you're talking about. And you say, yeah, 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 and you don't respond. And then a week later, <laughs> you get an even angrier response going, I need you to do this. Um, so in a panic, you kind of say, oh, this is, this is the title, this will be fine. And then you think, oh, God, I've got to talk about this. You know, the, the event creeps closer and closer, and it's like, right, what, what did I really mean by that? It sounded amazing at the time. Um, and it's really, this, you know, I'm talking about the third age of civic tech because, as we've already heard this morning, uh, civic tech has changed massively, and the way we think about it and the way we talk about it has changed massively. Over the last kind of 10, 15 years, civic tech has gone from not a thing um, to, to a really huge thing. Our sector has massively grown, um, and necessarily we have all grown with it, and the work we do has done so as well. But I've really noticed over the last kind of year, 18 months, a really big shift in how we talk about ourselves, um, in how other people talk about the work we do, how funders are approaching supporting the work we do. A lot of things have shifted quite a lot over the last couple of years. I mean, Tic Tech is five years old this year, which is amazing. Um, I know some of you in this room were at the very first one in London back in 2015. And the world has changed. <laughs> rather a lot. I remember 2015, it was a whole different kettle of fish. Um, the, the things we're talking about now, the things we're dealing with now, as Mark was saying earlier, um, are things that, I, that weren't even on the horizon for me back then. And because of the way things are changing, we really have to kind of take stock, I think. So in terms of this being a third age of civic tech, again, as Mark kind of alluded to earlier, 10, 15 years ago, when civic tech wasn't really a thing, we were just in this great innovation stage where individuals, you know, the pioneers of civic tech, some of whom I know are in this room, um, were just having an issue and they had mad coding skills and they just thought, right, I can solve this and maybe it can help some other people as well. They wrote a snazzy bit of code, up it went on the internet, and that was awesome. And very soon other people noticed this kind of tech and thought, you know, this could help other people too. There are problems in the world. This could solve it. Let's throw money at it. Let's throw resources at it. Let's scale this up. Let's pick this up and export it and put it down somewhere else. Why shouldn't someone somewhere else be able to benefit from this? And that has been great. And you know, for organizations like My Society, it enabled us to grow, it enabled us to make awesome new connections, speak to and work with people all over the world. Um, and we reached a point where we were massive and we were holding conferences like Tic Tac. But definitely over the last few years, I think we've reached this third age, this age where we're kind of mature. We're actually asking a lot more detailed uh, questions about what we're doing. We're reevaluating what we're doing, renovating, reinventing, reiterating, trying to make sure that the tools and the platforms and the tech that we're putting out there is doing what it say it's doing and it's doing it well and successfully and ambitiously. But that is a very kind of self-reflection phase. And we can either do it by carrying on doing what we're doing and looking very minutely, you know, throwing an A-B test out there every now and again to see how many page clicks you can get. Or you can do it in a much more substantial way. Because I think even though we're in this maturing phase, we do need to still evolve. We can't just stay as we are because that language is changing, because the way we work with people is changing. We have to move forward. But in order to do that successfully, in order to do that in a meaningful way that's worthwhile for the people that we serve, we actually have to look back properly. And that's not just looking back at, oh, did this make any difference? 
was there a little bit of an impact here? Was there a bit of an uptick here? We actually have to go right back to the beginning, right back to that first age, and test and question those assumptions that we've built everything else on. How have we built our entire civic tech castle on quicksand? Is it enduring? Are those assumptions what we really, really should be basing ourselves on going forward? Because laboring, laboring a metaphor, <laughs> I feel like this third age of civic tech is like the concluding part of a trilogy. It's like the third installment of a really good trilogy because it's all about going back to the beginning and finding out what was not true to begin with, all those assumptions that we've built everything on. It's about going back and saying, really, was this actually true? You know, turns out Indiana Jones wasn't called Indiana. What kind of assumptions have we made just because of the information that was presented to us at the time? What have we built on based on false information? Because I'm sure we have, not purposefully, but we are probably still holding on to some assumptions just because that's how we've always done things. And that's not necessarily the way forward. That's not the way to build a, a far more vibrant technology environment. The only way we can move forward is to really kind of test those assumptions and really, really ask ourselves hard questions and make hard decisions about where we want to be and how we want to influence the way tech helps other people um, around the world. So one of the things that we've been doing as the research team in my society, especially this kind of last year, is really, really looking at going back to the beginning rather than just, is this platform that we run or is this platform that our peers, uh, other organizations run, is this good? We've actually been going back to the beginning and saying, is, is the actual fundamental point of this still valid? Is it still something that we should be championing? Is it actually doing what we want it to do? And is it something that we really need to invest in going forward? Or do we actually have to make big changes? You know, is the assumption that you can just export this piece of technology and it'll work perfectly fine and be perfectly successful in the same way, is that still correct? It's probably not, spoiler alert. Um, you know, these are just some of the reports that we've done this year. And I think that these things show this research shows that it's not just, is it making an impact? Well, yeah, I can show it's making an impact. But is that actually what we're, what we're wanting it to do? Are we being ambitious enough? Are we actually being culturally sensitive enough when we're building this tech and exporting it and expecting it to, make, to work the exact same way? Uh, so yeah, we've, uh, we've done these kinds of research reports this year. Um, they're all online if you would like to go and read them. Some of the key things that we found is that Again, uh, kind of reflecting on what Anthony was saying earlier, we're working so much more now with institutions. You know, five, ten years ago, civic tech was this kind of little isolated bubble, and we were all good mates, and it was awesome, and we were all doing exciting stuff, and we were all excited about it. And we were very much outside of institutions, shouting at them that they needed to do better, that they needed to listen to us. And it's all very well being a critical friend to some of the bigger institutions, but meaningful change comes from within. Again, going back to that way that the language has been changing over the last 18 months, the way we see ourselves and the way we work over the last 18 months or so, that is changing because we're realizing, and institutions are realizing, that we are far better working together. We, you know, civic tech, our values, we should totally still be pushing those forward. You know, openness, transparency, accountability, in public institutions, we totally need to keep on at that, but we should be trying to make that change from a position of power, a position of partnership within institutions, not standing on the outside saying, well, I need to keep you at arm's length because I'm an NGO. We really, really need to be far, far more embedded in the institutions that we're working with to make sure that the kind of tech that we think makes a difference, that we know makes a difference, that people in this conference are gonna talk about this next couple of days, showing it makes a difference, that that is actually at the heart, not just of end service delivery, but how policy making is actually done. The other thing that we've noticed is that because we are again at this, in this kind of third age of civic tech, we're in this mature phase, we're almost taking our eye off the ball in some places, and I'm not saying everyone is guilty of this, but it's hard being a civic tech organization you're under-resourced, 
you've not got much money, you spend loads of time chasing money, you spend loads of time just trying to maintain the things you already do well. It takes an awful lot of effort, it takes an awful lot of time just to maintain the platforms that you already have. And all the time that you're either chasing money or trying to maintain, we're not actually embracing some of the new stuff that's coming through. Um, and whilst you know, there are fancy terms that are, that are bandied about by, about new technology, it is true that, somewhat ironically, for a tech sector, there might be tech that's actually leaving us behind because we're so busy trying to maintain this thing that we think that we're good at, this thing that you know, we have said, no, this is, this is what's happening, this is what we should be doing, that we're actually missing opportunities elsewhere. So that's something that's, again, a real challenge for us. Are these things that we want to do, are these things we should be doing, how can we do them better? Because they can be totally better. I mean, I don't know if there's a fourth age of civic tech. I still, you know, I'm not going to come back next year with the fourth age of civic tech presentation. I think this third age of civic tech is going to be around for a while. And I think we are continuing to mature. But I think the next phase might not even be civic tech. You know, maybe civic tech is dead after the third age. You know, the trilogy is concluded. And the next thing is the first stage of something else really cool and exciting that I don't even know what it is yet. Um, because everything's moving on so fast, and I think because everything is changing around us as well, and we are hopefully responding to the change and changing with it, um, it's, there's all sorts of possibilities. Yes, it's kind of daunting. You, know, you listen to Mark reel off the, uh, the problems of the world, and I was totally depressed. <laughs> um, there's, there's so much opportunity in that. There's so much more and so much interesting, innovative stuff that we could be doing. So maybe we're not just kind of this little bubble of civic tech that operates on our own anymore. Maybe we're kind of evolving and going out into the world. I mean, again, 10 years ago, my job didn't exist. Maybe in 10 years' time, it won't exist either. Maybe in 10 years' time, it'll be something completely, completely far away from here that is still maybe a little bit about impact or research, but about at a whole other level. Um, that might be daunting, but I think it's also exciting. I think there's so many people in this room doing so much amazing work, whether you're on the research side of things or the practitioner side of things, um, that I can't wait to see what amazing stuff comes out of the organizations and the initiatives in this room in 10 years' time, because I think it will be even more influential. I think we will be embedded far more in the kind of uh, institutions and the kind of ideas that are going around a more kind of normal level, rather than civic tech being, a, ooh, this, this is new, this might look cool. I think it will just be kind of standard. I'm hoping it will be kind of standard, because it's what we've been saying all along, that it should be embedded in the kind of service delivery that we want to see. So I'm totally excited. I'm, I'm not saying civic tech is like dead and we should hold a funeral and make it have a great wake. Um, I think we're just evolving. I think this this next phase in what we do as, uh, as organizations and as a sector is really, really exciting because there is so much more to do and there is so much out there, so much opportunity um, in the world that we can actually look at. So um, I would love for you to come and talk to me about anything. I know, I know some of you, there are some of you I haven't met. Um, please come tell me and my colleagues about what you're doing. Please tell me if you think what I've said is complete bollocks. I am open to opinions. Um, you know, Tic Tac's all about debate and, and kind of figuring out what we need to do as a sector to push it forward. So please do. I'm open to ideas. Um, but the main thing is, welcome. So happy to see all of you here and have a great Tic Tac. Thank you.